Good morning and welcome to Crossroads Church. We're so excited to have you join us either on campus or online. Did you know that our website and our digital handout are great ways to stay up to date on what's happening here at Crossroads? We want to make sure that you have an opportunity to get plugged in. So head to ccindy.info or use your phone's camera to scan the QR code on the screen right now. You'll be able to find sermon notes, check in online, see a calendar of events and give online. Social media is another great way to stay up to date with everything happening at Crossroads. Check us out on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, Spotify, and the Apple Podcast app. Those links are on your screen now. Hit that follow button to make sure you don't miss a thing. If you are new to Crossroads and haven't stopped by the Welcome Center yet, don't wait. Right after service today, head to the Welcome Center in the lobby to receive your free gift from one of our awesome Dream Team members. If you're new and joining us online, don't worry, we have something for you as well to say thank you for joining us this morning. Just let us know you're here by clicking that link in your chat. We are a church that believes in the power of prayer, and we want to partner with you in all of your prayer needs. There are a few ways that you can let us know how we can be praying for you. First, you can submit prayer requests online, either on our website or through our digital handout. Second, if you're joining us in person, you can fill out a physical prayer request card and drop it in the blue lockboxes in the lobby. The third way you can get us your prayer requests is by texting the word prayer to the number that you see on your screen right now. We have a team of people ready and available to pray for you. The website, digital handout, text to pray, and the prayer cards are also where you can let us know how God is answering your prayers. We love to hear about how God is working in your life. At Crossroads, we love to celebrate next steps, and water baptism is one of those next steps. If you feel like baptism is the next step for you to take on your faith journey, or you're simply interested in what baptism is all about, please join us for baptism orientation happening immediately after both services in room 115. A new season for life groups is right around the corner and we need you. If you're interested in or have interest in potentially leading a life group, now is the time to partner with Crossroads. Think about how you came to follow Jesus and how you have grown in your faith. You are who you are today because someone knew you by name and invested in you. Leading a life group gives you that opportunity to invest and perhaps make that same sort of impact in someone else's life. You may have heard us say that thriving people connect, and that happens when you sign up today at the link on your screen. Something else that we're excited about in the month of August is the launch of 21 Days of Prayer. From August 9th through the 29th, we will be intentionally seeking God every day in prayer as we believe for Him to move in powerful ways. If you sense God has more for your life, 21 Days of Prayer is a great place to start believing Him for all that He has for you. During these 21 days, we will also have two prayer nights and one night of worship. The prayer nights are August 11th and 18th at 7 p.m., and night of worship is August 25th at 7 p.m. As we practice seeking God first over these 21 days, I believe He will move on our behalf like never before, and that we will start to see the power of prayer impact relationships, work, family, and every area of our lives. Make sure you check out our website, which is where you can find important dates, a prayer guide, and much more. Finally, as we transition into a time of generosity, I want to highlight a passage from the book of Leviticus. In Leviticus 27.30, we read, A tithe of everything from the land, whether grain from the soil or fruit from the trees, belongs to the Lord. It is holy to the Lord. Now, while many of us are not harvesting grain or fruit to provide for our needs, the principle mentioned in this passage still applies to us today. In whatever way we generate income, the principle is that God must be honored with a tenth of it, not because he needs it, but because it belongs to him in the first place. In doing this, we acknowledge that God is the actual owner and provider of everything that we have, and we are more like tenants, fully dependent on him. We are simply returning to him what was his to begin with as an act of obedience and thankfulness. And that's all I have for you this morning. Thanks again for joining us in person or online, and have a great rest of your Sunday. I search the world, but he couldn't fill me. empty place and treasures that fade are never enough and you came along and put me back together and every desire is now satisfied
Come on, everybody in this room. Let's welcome all those who are watching from Baltimore and from Miami, uh, California, wherever you're watching from. We're so glad to have you a part of our CFAM, uh, our church family. 
uh, all across America every week, uh, tuning in, participating along with us. We have much more exciting things coming to our online uh, church family as well, and we'll be announcing some of that as we get along. But uh, we're so glad to have you with us today because today's a great day. We're, we're winding up our summer series, right? I wore my, my summer shirt uh, today, all right, because uh, we are winding up our summer series. It's been fun. We've had ice cream. We've had food trucks. We've, we've had icy stuff. We, we, we've, had all, we've had fun, right? And uh, we've seen lives changed, and God has spoken to us week after week after week in this series, and he is getting ready to speak to us again Today, I got connected with Joshua uh, through podcasts and started listening to him preach. And then I discovered he was getting ready to go out from National Community Church where I had found him and uh, listened to him speak and getting ready to launch a new church. And uh, I have a heart for church planters after planting two churches myself. And so uh, I just feel like God is going to use Joshua in this house today to speak to this church family in an anticipation of what God wants to say to you. Will you make my friend Joshua Simonet welcome as he comes to share with you? so good to be with you this weekend. Um, I did get the summer shirt blue, blue flower memo uh, from Pastor Craig. So uh, it's awesome to be with you guys. I'm just so grateful for this invitation and grateful to be sharing with you guys all the way from Baltimore, Maryland, um, as I have. Uh, well, as you saw on the, on the video, on the video promo, I have a favor to ask. Uh, I will solicit your prayers uh, and your support as we are trying to launch a church um, real soon, uh, T-minus uh, less than two months in, uh, in, in September. And so we, we need all the prayers and support uh, that we can get. You can follow us on, online, um, primarily through Instagram, at Hope Be More. Uh, if you don't mind, that would be great. And then, hey, do me a favor. Spread the word. Tell people. Um, you know, it, it, I just post it or, or share it or something. Hey, if you're ever in Baltimore, then come hang out with us too. Um, we love, love to host you as, as well. Hey, if you have a Bible this week, I'd love for you to meet me in Nehemiah chapter number one uh, or an app or whatever it is that you use. Uh, we'll, we'll get there in just uh, a few moments. But as I was prepping for uh, our time together uh, this weekend, I was thinking about my kids. Um, I'm a father of four kids, uh, my wife, Erica, and I have been married for 18 years. We've got one kid getting ready to go off to college. Um, you know, she's coming into her senior year. And then we've got one kid that's going on four. So we got bookends, y'all. That's not exactly how you draw it up. But, but that's, that's, that's where we at. You know, that's, that's where we are. Uh, but I'm thinking about my kids. And I'm thinking about how, especially my son, I've got one son, so I've got three girls and, and one boy, especially my son, whose name is Isaiah, he has total confidence in dad, you know, that dad can do anything and that dad can, can um, fulfill these this outrageous requests sometimes that he has uh, of me. And, and the other day he was asking me, dad, you got to build me a helmet. And I'm like, son, I, I don't even know how to, what, what would we use? But, but he, he has total confidence. But the other thing that happens with my kids, too, is that when things go wrong, and those of you who are parents or you work with kids, you know this is the case. When things go wrong, they are coming to you with this problem that they want you to solve, that they want you to address. There are tears and there's frustration and, and all of these sorts of things. And, and they have in their mind exactly what they want you to do, and even if it's just make the boo-boo go away or, or give them whatever it is they're asking for or just make it right, make it well, right? And here's the thing. As I thought about this, you know, this is not just what kids do. Like, we're not too far removed from our four- and five-year-old selves, right? When stuff goes right and we get frustrated and there are tears, we want somebody to fix it, right? And we have some clarity in our minds in terms of exactly 
what it takes to get this thing fixed. And for those of us who have a relationship with God, this is our time um, where we come to him with our prayer requests um, that uh, really oftentimes looks like an order at Chick-fil-A, right? Let me get a number one or a number two. Let me get this. Let me get that. This is how we come to God, right? We, with our request, because we have exactly in mind what it is we want to satisfy us, right? We, we have this, this, this expectation. And I was thinking about this as it relates to Nehemiah chapter number one. And I, I'm not sure if you're familiar with Nehemiah's story, but it, it, it's a very powerful story that, that we will unpack. But the situation is this. It's very, very desperate. Um, Nehemiah gets a, a download. He gets a, a, a G chat. He gets a text message. He gets, he gets some word from his homeboy that his people are in a desperate situation. Israel uh, is, is in a situation where the, the, the city wall is broken down and they're vulnerable, and it is a bad situation. Because anytime, uh, back in those times when the city wall was vulnerable, the people themselves were vulnerable and susceptible. And so Israel, at this point, historically, had gone from being a family when we see in the book of Genesis, okay, to a nation um, coming out of Egypt when they were enslaved to now a kingdom, although they, they became a divided kingdom, but they grew to a kingdom. Now they are a scattered remnant, a scattered remnant of people, uh, a shell of who they used to be. And this time period where Nehemiah is written is called the post-exilic period, meaning this is post-exile. They were exiled from their home, and they're returning back to Jerusalem. So this is the, the, the context of what is happening. Now, Nehemiah, let me tell you a little bit about Nehemiah. Nehemiah, is he's a Jew, but he's serving this foreign king, this Persian king uh, called Artaxerxes, and Persia was as modern-day Iran. And um, Nehemiah is a cupbearer, or he's like a butler. So he's very, he's in a, he's in a high-ranking position. He's close to the king, and he's very trusted uh, in his position. And Nehemiah hears this word. He's, he's over 1,200 miles away from Jerusalem, and he hears this word, and it, it, and it crushes him because his people are struggling. And what I love about this passage is Nehemiah models for us what our response should be when stuff hits our lives. He, he models for us how we are to engage with God and, and, and how we should proceed. As we can look around and see in our nation, in our local communities, there's a lot going on over, these la over this last year and a half. Things are not well. And we, we've had a multiplicity of reaction. Some of us responded with apathy. We're, we're just unbothered because maybe some of this didn't impact us, you know, like it impacted others. Some of us have sympathy. We feel bad for others. And then some of us have empathy. We feel bad with. And what I want to do for the next few moments is I just want to Zoom in, and I want to unpack what we see here in Nehemiah chapter number one. And we'll start with verse number four, and I think we're going to pop it up on the screen for you. I'm reading from the CSB version, which may be a little bit different from a version that you're used to. So if you would just follow along with me. Here, is, uh, here are the words of Nehemiah. He says, when I heard these words, starting in verse number four, I sat down and I wept. I mourned for a number of days fasting and praying before God, uh, before the God of the heavens. I said, Lord, the God of the heavens, the great and awe-inspiring God who keeps his gracious covenant with those who love him and keep his commands, let your eyes be open and your ears be attentive to hear your servant's prayer. And I pray to you day and night for your servants, the Israelites. I confess the sins we have committed against you. Both I and my father's family have sinned. We have acted corruptly toward you and have not kept the commands, statutes, and ordinance you gave 
your servant Moses. Please remember what you commanded your servant Moses. If you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the peoples. But if you return to me and carefully observe my commands, even though your exiles were banished to the farthest horizon, I will gather them from there and bring them to the place where I have chose to have my name dwell. They are your servants and your people. You redeemed them from your great power and strong hand. Please, Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant to and to that of your servants who delight to revere your name. Give your servant success today and grant him compassion in the presence of this man. If I had to tag this uh, text with a title this weekend, it would be the plan before the plan. The plan before the plan. And I'm going to unpack what I mean by that uh, as we go along. Right off the bat here, we see three things that Nehemiah does. Right in verse 4, it says that he wept or he lamented, he fasted, and he prayed, which is interesting to me because when stuff hits our lives, we normally do what? Jump into action. We're we're jumping into whatever it is we feel like we need to do. We might pray on the run. We might pray after the fact. We might pray when everything else runs out. But we are jumping into action first. But Nehemiah does the opposite. And I don't know, maybe it's because he's 1,200 miles away, maybe, but he does the opposite. And this is what it says that he does. He lamented, he fasted, and he prayed. And let me just break those three things down for us because it's important for for us to understand that lamenting or weeping on behalf of is a powerful thing because it draws our heart inward and it helps to activate empathy. Now, I don't need to to tell you that we probably need a little bit more empathy in our world today, right? Right. Now, now, now what? Imagine what it would be like if if our solutions or the execution of what we are trying to do is flowing out of empathy versus apathy or sympathy. Because sympathy says, oh, I feel bad for... And empathy says, I feel bad with. To empathize is to step into a situation and feel it the way the person feels it. I want to suggest to you that that is the tradition of the church. That we are to step into, just like the God of heaven in the form of Jesus comes down from heaven and steps into earth, steps into our situation when he doesn't have to. That's that's empathy. And then Jesus says, blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. So there's a blessing in mourning. There's a blessing in lamenting. Paul says that we have an obligation to mourn with those who mourn. And as I mentioned, what would our world be like if we had more empathetic execution versus sympathetic execution? Solution. Sometimes that just sounds like, oh, that's, I'm so sorry that I'm going to pray for you. And maybe we intend to pray, but we don't. Let's just keep it real, y'all. That's, that's sympathy as opposed to, you know what, God help me or praying, God help me to activate. Show me how to step in. Show me what I am to do. That's, that's prayer with an empathetic response. This was the case for Nehemiah. And you must understand that Nehemiah, he's in a very privileged position. He's he's so far removed from this. He's living in a palace because he's serving a king, and he got a good government job, y'all. He got a good government job. He know he's going to get paid regularly. The government ain't going out of business, you know. He's good. He's in a privileged position. He doesn't have to do anything. He can just, he might, he can send a little money, you know, he can pray, but he doesn't have to do anything. He can stay right where he does, but it says he lamented, and then the next thing it says is he fasted. Now, I got to be honest, this is a spiritual discipline that I need to be more personally committed to, because here's what fasting does. Fasting, it brings clarity to our lives, and it puts our soul attention on God. 
And it's, it's, it's saying, God, I want you and I want to hear from you and I want you to direct me more than I want to consume food. Now, listen, I love to eat, y'all. Listen, now, if we can push away food, that's a powerful thing. That's a powerful discipline. And what we're saying is, God, I need you more than the stuff that I put in my body to, to fuel me to live because you gave me this body. The pace and the demand of our world sometimes, a lot of times, most times, doesn't allow space for this. So we don't know the discipline or don't exercise the discipline of fasting and we, we resort to this pseudo time with God because we, we've squeezed the margins in our lives and we don't have the communion with God in this way. And so here's what we, what we do. We resort to the pursuit or the prioritization of resources instead of the source. They're called resources for a reason because they come from a source and God is the source. So we resort to resources that come from God as opposed to pursuing God. Finally, what Nehemiah does, so he laments, he fasts, and then he prays. And this is where I want to spend the rest of our time here. Because it wasn't just that he prayed, it was how he prayed. And I'm not suggesting to us that we don't pray, but I am suggesting that maybe we're not praying with the right mindset and the right focus. And what Nehemiah does for us is he unpacks for us the right kind of mindset and the right kind of focus. So, so let's just listen to how Nehemiah prayed. If you're taking notes, this, this would be my first point. point. Point number one, Nehemiah confessed the sins of Israel and his, in his own lament, all right? So oftentimes when stuff hits our lives, we are usually not saying, now God, I know I might have contributed to this. I know that I'm probably, no, that's not what we start. God, you need to fix this thing. <laughs> this thing is, bother- this is a problem. Like you, you need to address it. Well, that's not our starting point. Usually it's confession. Now, this might be where um, our Catholic brothers and sisters might have it right, you know, where they have this, this, this ritual of confession. But, but, but Nehemiah confesses not only the sins of Israel, but his own. And this is why this is significant, because, again, like I said, we tend to focus on the problem. But Nehemiah didn't directly contribute to what was happening with Israel. Israel was in the place that it was in because they had sinned, they had gone in a different direction to what God had called them to. That wasn't Nehemiah's fault, but Nehemiah realized that he was also complicit in some of the things that he has done as well, including what his family had contributed. He knows that even though he has not contributed, he is not completely innocent in his own life. And and what Nehemiah is showing us without explicitly saying is that he recognizes that there's some things in him maybe that that is not right. And so he's not coming to God as one who is righteous, but one who is unrighteous that needs a, a, a grace as well as he seeks God's hand. I want you to know that there's biblical precedence and This is a foundational rebuilding block here that we are seeing. This idea of lamenting and confessing sins of those who have gone before us. Now, I won't get into this, and and we don't have time to unpack this, but when we look at the history of our country, there's a lot of things that that have happened in our country before our time, and and oftentimes what we want to do is just say, oh, you know what? Let's just forget about that. Let's just move forward. Oh, don't worry about that. That, And and I get that sentiment, But, but listen, the people of God, the church, like we should be leading people and helping people understand the power of lamenting and the power of confessing as we move forward. It has a healing power to acknowledge that these things have happened as we, it's not holding us back, it's helping us move forward because we're healing. Now, listen, just in case you want to come for me and, and you, you, you got a different opinion, this is why we go to counseling, right? <laughs> right? I'm just saying. Right? You, li- listen, if your counselor just said, oh, listen, I, I know that happened to you when you were a kid. Don't worry about that. You're 40 now. 
That doesn't work, right? So, so why would we accept this in counseling, but we wouldn't accept this in other aspects of our life? Why, why, why would we accept this in a professional practice of counseling when there's biblical precedent for this? I'm going to just keep going. I'm going to just keep going. The, the, one, the one last thing I'm going I'm to just say since somebody said preach. Let me, let me just, let, let, let me, the, the, the one, the one, one listen, the one, one, one thing I'm going to say just as an example, just think about this for a second. Think about people who have experienced such trauma in their lives and they have PTSD. Think about certain people in their lives who, who have, have been victims of, of things like sexual assault or, or just, just all kinds of just crazy things. We would never tell those victims, why are you still having these episodes? Why are you still tripping about it? That happens. So we would never say that because that is so insensitive and it doesn't help the person heal. You know what our proper response is? To be with them and to comfort them. And guess what? For however long it takes, one year, two years, 10 years, for however long it takes. This is, this is a big part of this overall point of confession. And Nehemiah understands that this is, this is also a healing time that needs to happen for him and his people. So the first thing he does is, is, is he goes into a, a time of confession. The second thing he does, and I love this point right here, is he reminds God of his commandments and his promises. He reminds God. Now listen, this is, this, this, is, this is important because Nehemiah begins to pray God's word back to him, all right? So when we're praying, praying what God said in his word gets God's attention. Just like when my kids remind me, Daddy, you said. That, listen, nothing activates me more like, than when my kids say, but daddy, you said, my, my three-year-old almost had a meltdown the other day because she thought that I went outside and didn't take her on a walk like I promised. I was outside five minutes. I came back. She said, daddy, you said you would take me a walk. I said, babe, I just walked outside. We're going to go on a walk. But it reminded me again that like I better take her on this walk because I promised her I was going to take her on this walk. And so this is what Nehemiah does specifically. He echoes Leviticus 26, which we, which we wouldn't read, which we won't read. But, but he's echoing what God said to Moses. Basically, listen, if you don't do what you're supposed to do, I'm going to scatter you. But if you, if you return to me, I will restore you. That's basically what he said. So God, listen, I'm just reminding you that this is what you said. So when we pray, are we reminding God of he, what he said and his promises? Nehemiah knew that this was more than just about God restoring this city of Jerusalem, but it was also about the people returning back to God, which is why he's echoing what God said to Moses about the people returning. It's about returning to him, not to the city. When was the last time we prayed and reminded God of what he said? Well, hey, in order to do that, we need to know what he said. So that means we need to have the, the discipline of studying what he said and reading Scripture. So number one, Nehemiah confesses the sins of Israel and his own. Number two, he reminds God of his commandments and his promises. And then number three, and this is a very, very interesting thing that Nehemiah does. He asks God for compassion he didn't ask God to bless his agenda. He asked God for compassion. He says, God, give me compassion because he has in his mind what he probably needs to do, but he asked for compassion and not the blessing of his agenda. I said this previously. It, oftentimes when we pray, we're bringing this agenda, we're bringing this, this wish list, we're bringing this idea of what we want to see happen before God. Now, God, this the plan. If you just get with the plan, we're going to be straight. <laughs> this is what we need to do, you know. So I just need you to bless this, you know, all right? And if you ain't going to bless, I mean, at least let it be a little better, you know, like or something, you know. I'm okay if you deviate a little bit, but, but this is the plan. It's not what Nehemiah does. He, this, this is not what he does. He never presented an agenda or plans for God to bless. It's not recorded anywhere in Scripture. We don't read that he even had a strategy. Maybe he had some thoughts in mind. 
But he asked God generally for success and compassion. And what this shows is that Nehemiah prioritizes God's heart and will above his own. This is what it shows us. And he wanted God to go before him with with whatever he was going to do or he had in mind. And let me just tell you, just spoiler alert, okay? So at the end of Nehemiah 1, Nehemiah says, grant me compassion before this man. He's talking about King Artaxerxes. So he knows at some point that the word is going to come out, something is going to come up as he's in the presence of the king. And so he asks God basically to give him favor with the man who has the power. Now, listen, I just got to back up because you need to understand this. So so historically now, um, the the, the walls have been broken down, okay? And um, there was a rebuilding that was happening before, and it was shut down before. This was in the time of Ezra, so you need to go back one book in the Bible into Ezra and see what was happening. It was shut down. Guess who shut it down? Artaxerxes. Artaxerxes was the one who shut it down. And so I think... I think Nehemiah understands that, listen, if anything is going to happen, God going to have to work through this man who's in power. So give me compassion before that. I don't know, God, what you're going to do, but I feel stirred. But, but give me compassion before this man. Too many times, I'm just going to just talk about me. I'm not going to talk about you. But too, too, too many times, my prayers are focused on my agenda and what I want to see happen. And I'm missing what God wants to do because I'm not asking him what he wants to do. I'm telling him what I want him to do. I don't, that's just me. I don't know how y'all do it. That's just, that's just me. And here's the thing. What, what if we went before God and we just said, God, listen, I, you know, I don't know what's going to happen. And we got all this, you know, but I just, I just feel I, I don't have a plan, you know, but... Just give me success in whatever it is I'm going to do or whatever you're going to lead me to do. And give me compassion with, with the people and favor with the people that, that have power and authority. And, 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 you know, sometimes, you know, some of us are on the opposite extreme. You know, we like super Christian and God's going to do it. And, you know, like, yeah. We, and, and he is. But he works through his people. He, he, and, he work, and he even works through people who ain't his people. <laughs> you know, I mean, who, who not down for him, you know. I mean, that's just the way that he works. So what... what what if we approach it that way? And then I was reminded of this as I was studying, y'all. Uh, one of my favorite Proverbs, Proverbs 22.1, and you should write this down. It, this, this proverb here talks about favor, and, and you know what it says? It, it says here that favor is better than money. Now, listen, y'all know we love our money. Don't mess with our money. Don't talk about our money. <laughs> favor is better than money. Now, listen, Nehemiah, he has to have money. He has to have a a, a situation where he has access to things. But he realizes that, listen, he needs God's favor more than he needs the stuff he has access to. So let me see if I can land the plane for us like this this weekend. What we see in Nehemiah 1 is this, this bad news, all right? Nehemiah's people... I mean, they broke, busted, disgusted. I mean, they just got a whole bunch of stuff going on. The nation is in ruin. And it's obvious that Nehemiah is deeply disturbed by this. And, you know, it reminds me of this powerful story that happened in 1965. There's a woman by the name of Viola Luizzo. She was, uh, at the time in 1965, she was a wife a 39-year-old mom of five from Detroit, Michigan. And Viola was deeply moved by racial tensions that were happening in the country. A big part of that uh, had to do with uh, some of her upbringing in the South and her seeing uh, segregation and Jim Crow and all of those sorts of things. And then once she moved north to Detroit, she remained active uh, even in organizations like the NAACP. But, 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 but here's the thing that, that was just so interesting to me. Stuff is popping off in 1965 and, and there's this push towards uh, voter rights for, for blacks and Dr. Martin Luther King and others are, are going to lead this big march. And, and so Viola is all the way in Detroit, Michigan. She's uh, removed from the volatility of what's happening in the South. 
700 plus miles over a 10 hour drive if she's going to drive in her car. And, and guess what? Her husband warned her and he told her, he said, Viola, this is not your fight. And she said, honey, you're right. It's everybody's fight. And Viola's daughter said this. She said, mom believed Jesus when he said, the suffering and the needy are our people. So she left the comfort of Detroit, Michigan to drive all the way down to Alabama. And she ultimately sacrificed her life. She died. And it was said that Viola is the only white woman to die in the civil rights movement. I'm reminded, though, by the words of her husband that really reverberate with me because his concern for his wife was absolutely legitimate and practical. He knew it was volatile. He, knew, he wanted her to be safe. He was trying to protect her. But it indicates for me the powerful influence of comfort and control we desire in our life when stuff breaks out. How many times have we seen things that have stirred us? How many times have we seen things that have bothered us and we have resorted to staying in our comfortable place or trying to be active in the place of comfort? That's why the plan before the plan should be to ask God what his plan is. Because, listen, his plan probably won't be our plan. I mean, the, the scriptures tell us that his ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. And so if the plan before the plan is to ask God his plan, then we're open to whatever he wants to do, which is likely going to lead us out of our seat of comfort, out of our place of comfort, out of our comfort zone. And we love the stories of the Bible, but we don't consider how the, the people that God used were willing to step outside of what was comfortable for them. And so eventually, eventually what happens is Nehemiah, he does one or performs one of the most, the, the greatest uh, feats in script, one of the, the greatest feats in scripture. He helps rebuild a wall in 52 days. He didn't have a backhoe. He didn't have modern technology. Hey, listen, we don't even, it doesn't even tell us that he was a civil engineer, that, that he was a home builder, that he had carpentry skills. It didn't tell us any of that. I mean, he's serving juice to the king, y'all. So, and he's 1,200 miles away, at least, from the Persian Gulf all the way to Jerusalem. But he's stirred, and the plan before the plan is to pray God, what do you want to do? And he eventually leaves from that place. Artaxerxes gives him all of the things he needs to go on the trip, all of the supplies, all of the paperwork to travel. And God blesses this miracle mission. And you know what? We read Nehemiah 1, and we're, and we're power executors, and we're type A personalities, and we're about getting it done, so let's get a strategy and make it happen, and we forget the plan before the plan, which is the pray, God, what is it that you want to do? So we focus on the feet and the outcome of 52 days, but we forget what he did before that. I'm going to ask our worship band to come and just prepare us for a time of worship for whatever God wants to say to us in this moment. Because here's the thing. We got some stuff going on in our country, y'all. We got some stuff going on in our communities. We can't afford to be apathetic. And we can't afford to just be people of prayer. We need prayer and action, but we need the action to be, perform to be informed by prayer. And what Nehemiah shows us is that lamenting, fasting, and prayer is necessary to bring about God's intended outcome. And can I tell you this before I just make this appeal to you? Can I tell you this? The historical timeline tells us that Nehemiah did this for at least four months. Y'all, we struggling with four minutes. He did this for four months. This was, this was God going before him and him setting the atmosphere for whatever God wanted to do for four months. 
This is what he did. I just wonder, what is it that God is putting in your heart that he's stirring you about, that you're frustrated about? And maybe you don't know what to do. Well, I came to offer you a plan before the plan, which is prayer and maybe some lamenting and some fasting as well, because as Jesus told the disciples, hey, listen, y'all out here trying to do your thing. Some, some of this stuff ain't gonna happen without fasting and prayer. So we gotta add that piece to it too. So here's the thing. I think we're in one or two camps this weekend. One camp is, hey, you know what? You, you are a believer in Jesus. You wanna follow him and, and you committed your life to him or, or you would say that you are a Jesus follower. But maybe you gotta step outside of that comfort zone just a little bit. And you just gotta be willing to, to, to just say, God, what is it that you want me to do? Show me. Or maybe you're in the second camp and you're like, you know what, I've been trying to figure this God thing out and man, I just, I just don't know like, you know, where, where I'm going in my life. Listen, if you don't have a relationship with, with Jesus, it's gonna be hard to figure that out. And you're just gonna be, you're just gonna be trying stuff and just going here or there and it's not gonna produce what it could in your life because you're misdirected. And so whatever camp you're in this weekend, I'm just gonna pray for us quickly and then our, our band is going to lead us in a time of worship as we ponder these things in our heart. God, we thank you so much for this day. We thank you for how you've shown us through Nehemiah that sometimes we just need to stop and the things that are stirring in our hearts, we just need to open up our hands and we need to say, God, what do you want to say to us? What do you want to do? How do you want to lead us? Help us to have enough humility to confess our sins and how we have maybe even been involved and, and maybe not even known the role that we played. Or those who are trying to, to, to discern you and, and, and establish a relationship with you, that, that they would confess their sins, that, that they, have, they have gone in a, in a different path and haven't pursued you. God, will you, will you activate that relationship today? And God, just give us clarity. Show us what you have us to do. Because the, the stories in the Bible that we love are ordinary people who have submitted their lives to you and you've done extraordinary things through them because they submitted to you. So we submit ourselves to you today and ask that, we, that you would let your will be done. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Let's worship together. Tell Joshua just how much that word meant to you today. Wow. So good. So good. This is some of you, you need to hear it again. So this week, you, you should play it back again. Because uh, you, you maybe were like me, you couldn't write fast enough. Sometimes the Holy Spirit was saying some things. And uh, also, uh, you need to share it with other people, okay? Because you just don't know who wasn't here or who wasn't watching already, uh, some of your friends. And when you share it, then it ministers to them. Uh, we're getting ready to worship, but I want us to just bow our heads one more time. And if you're in this room, and if you say, you know, Craig, I, I'm away from God, and I need to make a commitment today before I leave here. I know something's stirring. Joshua was talking about something stirring and there's something stirring in me. And, and I think I need to commit myself to God. And, and maybe you don't even know what all that looks like, but, but you know you're away from God. And today you want to commit to Him. Will you just raise your hand and say, yeah, that's me today. Yeah, just raise it up. All right. Let me, let me pray with those who raised a hand and let, let's just have everybody pray it so that those around will have courage to pray it out loud as well. Just say, Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for sending Jesus to die on the cross for me, to pay for my sin. I believe his death paid for every sin that I ever have done and ever will do. And from this point forward, as much as I know how, I surrender my life to you. Take me, I'm yours. 
And I thank you for receiving me. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, let's worship God today. Oh, you can do better than that. Come on. For those who raised a hand, those online. Listen, if you're in this room, uh, then what you need to do is maybe take a next step. And you can go over to baptism class and you can find out how to show on the outside just like a bunch of people did today uh, what God did in inside of your heart and life. And you, you can learn how to do that. For others of you, maybe go out to the Welcome Center. If you're new today, we'd love for you to receive a gift. For others of us, we need to get ready for our 21 days of prayer coming up. We'll talk more about it in the next couple weeks. But in August, you get ready. 21 days is coming back, all right? We're, we're going to pray, and uh, I just believe this message is getting us ready for what God wants to do. Somebody said, maybe says, uh, when you going to preach again? Well, uh, I'm going to preach the next five weeks in a row, okay? So, so just be ready. Next Sunday, God's given me a word for next Sunday. Don't you miss it. Let's stand together and give a prayer to the Lord and the worship team's going to help us worship and if you need prayer for any reason at all we'll have some prayer partners down front so you can come forward and receive prayer today. Father we thank you for the word today. We thank you for ministering to our hearts, our spirits. God as we go out of this place we pray we'll take our next step whatever that is and God we thank you and praise you for all you're doing and what you're going to do we worship you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. This is what living looks like. This is what freedom feels like. This is what heaven sounds like. We praise you. We praise you. This is what living looks like. This is what freedom feels like. This is what heaven sounds like. We praise you, we praise you. This is what living looks like. This is what freedom feels like. This is what heaven sounds like. We praise you, we praise you. This is what living looks like. This is what freedom feels like. This is what heaven sounds like. We praise you, we praise you. You'll see you break down every wall. We'll watch the giants fall. Fear cannot survive when we praise you. The God of breakthrough.